Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our week 11 live classroom. It's pretty crazy we're in week 11 already. You guys are like, yeah, already. It's taking forever. Um, it's been it's been fast for me. Um, but anyways, welcome. Glad that you guys could make it. Uh, as you may know, this week we are in the same chapter as last week. So last week we covered the chapter on functions, chapter 9, and we will not learn anything new this week other than just building on on that. So, uh, but before we go in any, into this, um, I wanted to ask if there are questions from last week or any questions regarding the class. Good morning, Lena. How are you? Could, could you review the calling a function thing? Because I know I screwed that up. Um, which calling a function thing? Just like a, an example of how to call a function? Yeah, how to call a function, the commands that you're using. Yeah, let's do it. All right, chapter nine, functions. Let me close that. We don't care about C++. All right, chapter nine. So here in a couple minutes, we're going to go over this program. But let me just pull it out. So if I look, let me zoom in on this a little bit. So, so far in the class, we have always had something very similar to this, right? In our HTML, we have a button with an on-click attribute, and the value of that attribute is a function call, okay? And this part right here, inside of the quotes, is exactly how you call a function in JavaScript, okay? If I zoom in a little more, you can see here's a function call in JavaScript, alert, open parenthesis, closing parenthesis, and it just so happens that the built-in function alert in JavaScript takes a parameter, okay? And whatever you put in as that parameter, it will print out in that little alert pop-up window. Okay, and it's the same thing with our functions. We call a function uh, by writing out the function name and then having an opening and closing parenthesis. Um, and if you have any parameters for that function, uh, you can put them in here, okay, uh, to call those. Now in JavaScript, what that looks like, I just gave you one example of how to call the alert function in here. Uh, here's another one. Parse int is a function. You can see I have the opening opening parenthesis right here, and it has the closing parenthesis over here. Prompt is another function in JavaScript that we call. Now all of these are built-in functions, okay? Now here's my function that I wrote right here called number guessing game. If I wanted to call this inside of the JavaScript, I could just come down here and say, uh, number guess game and I could call it just like that the exact same way that I do inside of the um, on click attribute of our button um, I just don't need the on click because it's not an HTML and I don't need the quotes because it's not an attribute of an HTML element okay you don't have to set it to a variable either nope so, I mean, and that, that totally depends on the structure of your function, okay? So, the only time you would set it to a variable is if your function will have something like this at the end, okay? If your function returns a value, uh, whether it be a string, an object, um, a number, anything, if, you're, if, you're, if you have this return keyword at the end of your function, it means, okay, your function is going to do something and it's going to return a value, okay? So... Going back to our example last week, if I had a function that was to get the circumference of a circle and we passed in a radius, you know, I would say return circumference. And um, then down here, I could say var c equals, you know, and that would get me my circumference into this variable right here. So, so it depends. In this example right here, um, I don't have a return statement. This is what my function looks like. This is where it ends. Um, I don't have any returns in it. Uh, instead, I'm alerting um, to, like in this function, I have an alert and I'm alerting that message instead of returning it and printing it from there. So, great questions. Any, any other questions? So how would that show up if you, if you just put a number guess game at the end right there? Would it come up as like an alert? Yeah, so let's try that. If I commented out this, this piece of code right here, okay, and I'm gonna comment this out too for a sec just so we can make sure that it's running without errors. Okay. Okay, so I have a white blank page because I just commented out my button. Uh, it doesn't look like I have any errors in here, okay? So this is just fine because my code right here, I don't have anything in HTML. Uh, you know, I did have this button, but now I just commented it out. So that's why we have a blank page over here. 
Now, let's see what happens if I uncomment this function call right here on line 38. If I uncomment that, as soon as the page runs, it will go through my JavaScript code. Okay, so just now, Google Chrome and its little JavaScript compiler, it just read through all this stuff, it read through all this code right here, and it's like, oh, we're calling a function. So before my script ends, it actually called this function. And it actually does this before it even gets to the body of the page. So if right here in this function, I referenced if I had like get element by ID or something, it would throw me an error because that element on the page with that ID will not have been rendered yet at this point. Okay, and that's why usually we call our functions from buttons. It's because usually we're like, oh, we need like an input from a user, you know, get element by ID. Um, but if I just call the function like this, you know, it'll run it like that before it's even loaded the page or the HTML, I should say. Okay, so notice it ran it and um, then we have our function right here. So it, and notice I, I put this after I declared the function. If I move this up top and saved it, let's try running this again. Let's hit refresh. It's a stubborn program. Hang on one second. This is like not letting me get out of this. So anyways, if I if I put this function call beforehand, that would also throw an error because it would it would say, hey, number guess game isn't defined. Um, and that's because I'm defining it afterwards. Okay. So any any other questions about this? How about reviewing the different ways that you can print things on the screen? I know there's an alert, and then there's actually something called print, correct? Um, there's document.write. Uh, so so let's, let's look at that real quick. Let me close this program and let me take that out and uncomment that. Okay, so document.write. Right here, let's do that real quick. So if I said document.write, notice my function call right here. Okay, and I can pass in a value to this write function that's built into JavaScript. And this will write <clears throat> this will write this message to the page. Okay, I actually don't like this program very much for for just playing around. So let's go to this one. Because this one this one won't have like endless alert boxes if I guess the wrong number. So uh, so right here, here's one example that we've seen many times. Uh, document I get, el get element by ID dot enter HTML and that will print something to that ID. In, in the HTML, right? We've seen it a bunch of times. That's one way. The other way is to say alert C temp. Whoops. Okay. The other way is to say document.write C temp. Okay. Now let's look at each one of these. So for now, I'm going to comment out both of these lines and we can run this function. I'm going to copy the file path and paste it. Okay. So uh, Fahrenheit to Celsius conversion, let's say we have 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and it pops out 10 degrees Celsius. Okay, if I look at my HTML, I'm going to right click on this 10, hit inspect, and it brings me straight over to the div that I right clicked on. Okay, it has the output div, it's this ID, and it injected this number 10, this value number 10 in here. Okay, and that's because in this function, let's go over to it. It said, all right, once you have that C temp, the Celsius temperature, go ahead and put that into the HTML, the inner HTML of the HTML attribute that has the output div ID. Okay. So again, this isn't anything new. We've seen it a bunch of times in this course. Now let's do our next one. Alert C temp. All right. So I'm going to put in 50 right here and hit the button and it just alerts 10. Okay. And let's look at our last one that I had here. Now, usually we save the best for last. This time I saved the worst for last. So just keep that in mind as you see this. Okay, I'm gonna hit the button. And you can see it printed out 10, which is great. You know, that's what we wanted. But my input's gone, my button's gone. If I had had a header on this page, if I had had anything else on this page, it would also be gone. Okay, so I discourage students from using document.write. Uh, you will never see it uh, used anymore in a professional environment because of how far web technologies have come. 
and how far and how far JavaScript has come. Uh, I imagine that this function was written way back in the day uh, when when there weren't very many options uh, of how to display data that that customers or individuals were quer querying. Uh, but nowadays, you will never see like oh you hit like the submit button and everything just vanishes and you see like yeah, that was successful or whatever. Um, but that's what document write does. It replaces the entire document with whatever you put in, inside that parentheses in, as that parameter. Okay, so those are three ways that you can display data on the page. Again, uh, I saved the worst for last. Don't ever do this. Um, alerts are good, can get annoying if you do too many of them. And uh, document .get and by ID in our HTML is what we've been using the most because that's that's the best way to do it with with vanilla JavaScript, with just basic JavaScript. So, great questions. Any other questions? And anything else about last week? Uh, and just know, this entire live classroom, I'm just going to be going through these programs, OK? So you guys can keep on asking questions. Uh, but any, any other questions about last week before we dive in? OK, so let's go back to this program right here, all right? So this program, if you look at the end of the book, it says rewrite the number guessing game code found in review question 16 of chapter eight so that it is inside a function with this header. Okay, so it has us basically using our newfound knowledge of functions and how we can just write as many functions as we want and have them call each other, which is called when a user clicks a button. It uses a different pseudo random number between one and 100 each time it runs counts the number of guesses the user takes to correctly guess the answer. All right, so my logic here, uh, we have the on click, which calls the number guessing game, the number guess game function. And then in here, we have a message that says, all right, guess number between one and 100. And then here is how I um, got a number between one and 100, a random number. So math.random, here's our math object in JavaScript, which has a billion things in it. Uh, and random is a function inside of it. Now what random will do is it will generate a random number between zero and one. Okay, this decimal number is uh, extends greatly. Um, sometimes it'll have like 15 to 20 decimal points in that random number that it generates. Uh, and me multiplying it by 101, I'm saying, okay, I want this not between zero and one, but between one and 100. Uh, and I say math.floor to force it to round down. Notice I multiplied it by 101 and not 100. And that's because, um, you know, it, it, it could be 100, you know, and if it was like a really high number between zero and, and one, and I multiplied it by 100, there would be instances where, you know, I might go out of range. Um, but where I'm forcing it to round down to a whole number, um, I, I multiplied it by 101, okay? So if you were curious, that's how I, uh, uh, got a random number in that range. Uh, and then I declared number of guesses as zero because they haven't guessed yet. And then I just declared guess so that I could um, assign it a value later on. Okay. Any questions to this point? All right. Then I had a do while loop, which again isn't super common. Usually you'll see for loops, while loops, or for each loops. Uh, but in this do while loop, the reason why I chose to do do while is because I need them to guess at least once, okay? And then when they guess, I'll check to see if that answer was too low or too high. And, uh, and then I'll keep on looping while their guess is not equal to the answer, okay? And then notice um, I'm incrementing the number of guesses each time, regardless if it's too low or too high, so that at the very end, I can output how many guesses it took them to do it. Okay, and that output will just pop up and in a little in a little alert box. All right. So if I run this, we just have this button right here, and I could say 50. Say, oh, number's too high, so I'll say 25. That's too low, so 37. That's too low, so 45. That's too low, 48. Too high, 47. Wow, that's interesting. Oh wait, that's still too high. Okay, so 46 was the correct number, and it said it took me six tries. All right, and the reason why it kept on popping up like that was because every single time I guessed it wrong, guess wasn't equal to the answer. So it would loop through back here again and it would jump back up here. And it would pop up this prompt with my same message saying, I'm thinking of a number between one and 100. And, um, 
And then I would also say, you know, I'd also add onto that message saying it's either too low or too high. So any questions about this one? Sorry, Brother Birch, I still don't understand how you would get it between one and 100 by doing the multiply by 101. Can you just explain that a little more? Yeah, so it's, it's this math.floor thing right here. Okay, let me run this real quick. Uh, and we're gonna stick a breakpoint on math.random to, to show what that pulls up. All right, so I'm gonna hit the button. All right, here's our beautiful math object with a bunch of stuff that we can use. If I, hover, if I highlight from the end of these parentheses to the beginning of math, I can have the computer um, compute a random number for me. Okay, there's our random number between zero and one, uh, 0.453 on, okay. So if I multiply that by 101, here's what we get. Whoops, I highlighted it, parentheses on accident. Okay, we get 4.722. Now, notice my random number was 0.443. All right, so this might actually change like the output of my random number, but where it's a random number, it doesn't matter. What I'm worried about is I want it in a specific range. Okay, if I manage to have like a random number that was, um, you know, say like 0.99, and I multiplied it by 100, I'd get 99. And with math.floor, um, it, it would round it down to a whole number, but I might end up going out of range. And so I used 101 right here just to make sure that I would never go out of range. And I'm like, you know what? I'm, I have a random number here. It doesn't really matter if, if you know, it, if, it ends up a little bit different than this math dot random value. But it's kind of hard to show this right here just because each time I hover over this, it generates a new random number. So let's come into here and I'll say math dot random. Part random equals math dot random. And then here I'll put that there. Okay. And I'll leave my breakpoint on the same spot. Let me close this so we don't have to play the game. All right, I'll leave my breakpoint on the same line of code and now our math.random won't change. Okay, so our random number is 0.94, roughly. All right, and if I multiply that by 101, we end up with 0.95, okay? Now, my number just now was 0.945 something, something, something. And so that would have gone up to 95. All right, because our random number right here is 0.9459, and so that'll round up eventually to 0.95, which will be 95, and if we round down, um, it'll, it'll end up being 94, okay? And so if I multiply this by 101, then we end up with 95.53, and then if I floor that, it'll just end up at 95, okay? Okay, that makes more sense. I was just, I guess I forgot that it only, um, the math.random only produces numbers between zero and one. That makes more okay. sense. Okay, awesome. Good question. Sorry if I talked forever on that. I'm glad that helped. No, you're good. All right. Any so other? I'm confused how it can go out of range if you put the math floor. <laughs> like you round it down to certain numbers. So how would it go out of range? Yeah, you know, seeing this running, um, I'm not sure if it could actually. I think I'm, I might have put this in here. There might have been like an instance where I had it run and it might have been too low. And so I, I multiplied it by 101 to make sure that it was between 1 and 100 and not 0 and 100. That's probably what it was. Because let's imagine for a second if the random number was like, if it ended up being like 0 0.001 or something like that. Um, if I multiply that by 100, um, then it could still be less than 1. You know, let's say this was like 0, 0, 0, 1, and I multiplied that by 100, it would be like 0. 0.1, and then the math.floor would knock it down to 0. And so I, I think I, I multiplied it by 101 to make sure that, that wouldn't happen, and it would be between 1 and 100 and not 0 and 100 inclusive. Does that, does that answer your question, Lena? Okay. 
Great question. You guys had me sweating there for a sec. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Um, well, if you guys don't have any other questions, let's go ahead and move on to our next assignment here. And I want to make sure I don't get a wrong one in here. Okay, so our next one, Fahrenheit to Celsius. All right, so pretty simple. Our HTML looks like this. We have a Fahrenheit label with an input, a button, and then an output div. All right, notice I do have two functions in here. All right, the assignment prompt said, uh, that we do need two functions. We have uh, this one right here, do input output, which it says will be called from the onclick attribute of a button. It'll get the temperature in Fahrenheit from the text field. It'll call the second function, Fahrenheit to Celsius, which will do the math. Uh, that function will return a value to a variable and then we'll output that variable. Uh, so if I look here, you can see, let me take that ugly stuff out of there. Um, you can see I got the value from the input from the user. I called Fahrenheit to Celsius, and then that function returned a Celsius value that I assigned to a variable, and then I printed that variable in the output div. Okay. Any questions on this logic or something you guys could see could be better or worse or anything? I don't think I, I see everything you're doing. The only question I have is when, when you have the input come through and you're yep. reading your thing, when does that program know to go down and put the, I guess I do, but I guess I've always, I was confused last week even, I get more of it this week. But when you, when the input was, a, when the user puts his number in, from the top of the do input output, when does the program know to kick down to the far to sell function, if that That's makes sense? Yeah, that's a great I, question. I, I, I sometimes see it, sometimes I get confused. I don't know. Yeah, so let's run it and I'll show you with an example. How's that? All right, so I'm gonna put a breakpoint right here and see what it's doing. If I hit this button, um, this code will always execute the exact same way. Regardless of what the user has put in, it's only stopped at the moment because of my breakpoint, but if I didn't have this breakpoint right here, it would have ran the entire thing and would have output nothing or perhaps thrown an error because I'm trying to do math on a null value, okay? But let's see what happens. So right here, uh, this came up as not a number because I didn't put in a number. So I tried to parse a null value. Um, if, I, if I hover over this right here, you can see it came up as an empty string. And so when I tried to parse that, it's like, that's not a number, can't parse it. And so that's why F temp right here is not a number, all right? But notice that it did run it. Okay, it didn't wait for the user to put in anything. As soon as I push that button, it ran my function. Okay, and it will just see what's there currently in this input box, assign it to this value, and then it will call our next function. It'll just go to the next line of code. All right, so to answer your question, um, it knows to go forward just because that's its function. That's what it does, it just goes forward. And it doesn't wait for anything. As soon as the user pushes, as soon as the user pushes this button, it It'll, it'll run this entire thing unless it hits an error. Does that answer your question, James? Yeah, that does, okay. thank you. Yeah, awesome. All right, any other questions about this? Okay, notice one thing that I did here. Um, this function right here, Fahrenheit to Celsius, is extremely concise. Had I wanted to, I could have broken it up and said like var Celsius um, equals, and then put my formula there, and then return Celsius. Okay, this is totally fine. Um, and that's probably how I wrote it initially. I might have even wrote it with like each chunk individually to make sure that I was getting the values that I wanted. Um, but in the end, I was like, you know what? This could be reduced a little bit and just make it like that, so. All right, and if you're curious, we could have reduced it further as well. I could have put this whole thing right here, whoops. Okay, JavaScript is pretty flexible and it would allow something like this, but it would just break this down one piece at a time. It would say, okay, uh, document, get element by ID, grab this value, then I'll parse that value, and then I'll call this function on that value and return this to ctemp. If you really wanted to reduce it, we could throw this right there, 
but that's getting a little hard to read. It's, it's a pretty lengthy row, okay? But this, this would work the exact same way if I run this and I take this off, this breakpoint off, you can see it ran it the exact same way with just this one line of code, okay? But it's a lot easier to debug and make changes if you kind of do like one step at a time, so. All right, no more questions on this one? All right, well, let's keep going then. So our next one, exercise number four, program for temp, relative humidity, and heat index. All right, so the prompt in the chapter said, create an HTML document which, create, which contains two fields, two text fields, a button and a div. Uh, label the first text field temperature and the second relative humidity and put the text heat index on the button, write two functions with these headers. We have do input output, which I will just say will do the exact same thing as all of our other do input outputs. It will get the input from the user, however many there are, and call a function inside of our code, which function will return something to the first function, and then the do input output will also display something on the page. And then we have our heat index function, which will just do our math, okay? It says take a temperature, in Fahrenheit as a parameter, take relative humidity as a parameter, calculate the heat, in, heat index as a temperature, and then return that heat index in Fahrenheit, okay? And uh, I'm not sure if this was provided in, in the prompt. I'm guessing it was. I think it was, but it was a little confusing and I had to Google it. Um, I think they included it as an image. Uh, and so I ended up Googling it to just to make sure that I had minuses right with other algebra things that were in the image. All right, so our do input output. Uh, if I was gonna put comments in here, I could say this is our input. Um, and right here, I have some error checking, okay? So we'll cover that in a second. But then down here, I have our output. And then this could be considered our processing. All right, uh, this right here, I just did a little bit of error checking because I, I noticed, um, that in order to compute this with the function that was given, uh, there, there were certain stipulations, one of which was the temperature had to be at least 80 degrees. Otherwise, um, this formula that they gave us would not work, okay? And so if the user typed in a, a temperature that was less than 80 degrees, I would say, hey, um, you need something less than 80 degrees. And when I put return like this, it'll just end the function right there. It won't run any of this stuff, which means it won't call this function, it won't output anything to page. It'll just return, stop the function, and then the user can type in another value and hit the button again to run it again. Okay, and then I also noticed through trial and error that the humidity had to be um, between zero and 100, zero and 100, because it's a percentage, okay? Uh, any questions to this point or about any of this? I guess I have a question for you guys. Would it be more helpful if we did these together or if we just kind of run through them with the solutions that I wrote? I'd prefer together better. <laughs> yeah? Okay, then the next one we'll do together. <laughs> All right, and then we have our heat index, which um, is just a bunch of math. Uh, this is actually all one single line of code, uh, which I have just split out into different lines, but it's actually one, one line of code. Um, but it's doing this right here. It's, that's all it's doing. Okay, um, so let's go ahead and run this. All right, so if our temperature was 120 degrees and our humidity was 50%, heat index pops up at 195 degrees. And if we put a breakpoint in here, Okay, so we get our temperature first from the user, our humidity next. Check to make sure that temperature is greater than 80. And check to make sure that humidity is between zero and 100. And then we call heat index, okay? I didn't have a break, a break point in heat index, but that was just called. It ran through this entire thing. It returned the heat index, which was assigned to calculated heat, which was 195.5, which was displayed to the page. Okay, any questions on this?
All right, well, let's go to our next one. All right, program that calculates the volume of a triangular prism. All right, let's open up our chapter here. Chapter nine about functions. All right, that's the surface area of a pyramid. Wow, there's lots of instances of triangular in this. That's surprising. All right, so example five, <coughs> or programming exercise number five. All right, so this image shows a triangular prism. The volume of this can be computed, can be calculated by multiplying the area of the triangular face by the length of the prism. Prism. In other words, triangle area times length equals volume of our three-dimensional object. All right, so write a program that calculates the volume of a triangular prism. Your program must allow the user to enter the three side lengths of the triangular face and the length and the length of the prism. Your program must include these three functions. Do input output, prism volume, triangle area. Okay, so our do input output is going to get all the input values from our user and output whatever was returned from our functions. Prism volume is going to be called uh, with all four of our parameters, all four of the inputs from the user. And somewhere inside of prism volume, we're going to have to call triangle area to get the area of the triangle, which we will then multiply by the length inside of prism volume. Okay. Make sense so far? Are we good to move on? I'll take silence as a, as a yes. All right. So let's go ahead and dive into this. I'm going to close these. I'm going to grab my template function down here, copy the entire thing, and paste it into a new file. And we will call this chapter 9 exercise 5.html. All right. Here's my template function. I've, I've shown it a few times. I do have a little bit of styling, not much, just kind of centers it on the page. Um, I have the starting of a defining table and a function which does exactly what do input output does. Okay, uh, so let's just run this, make sure it doesn't have any errors. Let me copy the file path and paste it. All right, template function or template program, don't have any errors. All right, so what is the first thing that we're going to have to do? Let's look back at this real quick. What is the first thing that we have to do, or that we should do? The defining table? Yes, great answer. OK, so what is our input? Let's look back at that real quick. What will our input be? A, B, C, and length. Perfect. So uh, three side lengths and length of prism. Uh, what will our output be? The prism volume. Okay, good. And what will our processing look like? It'll be taking the, the lengths that a user puts in and then processing through the, through the math or through the math function to be able to return that area back to your, to get your answer or something. Yeah, to perfect. Do your volume. I, yeah. yeah, so let's grab this. We can use that in our defining table. Uh, but I want to break it down a little bit more uh, to figure out how we're going to get triangle area. So they did give us a hint uh, to use the triangle area function written in this chapter, which is this. All right, um, so let's see where A, B, and C are the lengths of the three sides, and S is the semi-perimeter of the triangle defined by this. Interesting. All right, so I'm going to need both of these. So we'll say semi-perimeter equals um, A plus B plus C. All right, and then triangle area equals
square root of this. Okay, and then triangle area. So how does that look for our processing? Does the semi-perimeter need to be divided by two? Yes, thank you. All right. Okay. Wow, you like how I'm like throwing JavaScript up in here? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Anything else you guys think we need in our defining table? Okay. You need to have to. Do you need to call the func the tell which way how it, how it, how it calls it? Uh, you were saying yeah. you need that in the in the processing. Yeah, that that is totally up to each individual. We could totally right. throw that in here. So oh, that's fine. Uh, I just wanted. So let's see what it said. Um, I guess this is, what are these called? Oh, they're not called anything. Okay. So I think that would actually be really nice to have in here because they're kind of stingy on how they want these written. So we have do input output. Um, so let's say our prism volume function will call these, okay, and then our triangle area function, we'll call this, okay, and then we'll put this one back, one where the prism volume will be called. Does that help, or is that confusing? I think that helps. Okay, awesome. All right, well, let's dive into this. Template function is no longer a template function. We will need to call it do input output. Okay. And what next? What do you guys think? Let's start doing the triangle area first, the function triangle area. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. If I had a function called triangle area, is that what it's going to be called? Yes. With these, I should have just copied that header. All right. So here's our function triangle area. And according to up there, it said we need to calculate the semi-perimeter. So let's put that right here. No hyphens in these names. All right. Should be good to go there. And then... Was that it for, oh no, I'm like, okay, there's something else here. All right, um, so this actually should go down into here, right? Because that's where we're gonna be doing our triangle area. All right, and then we'll do math.square root of this. Does that sound okay? Math.square root of that. Make sure we got all these parentheses right. All right, S isn't defined. Let me look back at our, at this hint up here. So we have this, which is defined as S, and then the area will be S times S minus A times S minus B times S minus C. Okay, so I'm actually gonna name this S Okay, just so we can, that's what they called it. Um, and then in JavaScript, we have to explicitly put a multiplication symbol there, which is why that arrow is there. And we'll have S minus A, S minus B, S minus C. Um, all right, does that look okay, you guys? I think you times the each side by each side every time, don't you? According to what I look in the book, Ish. they've got a, yeah. Perfect. Okay, anything else? I don't think so. All right. Well, it'll be kind of hard to test this until we have other stuff set up. So what else do we need? I have a question before you move on. Yeah. You need it. 
return on the triangle area, like a return area? Sure do. Let's do it. Um, or we could just say return, right? Yes. Very good. All right. Anything else? All right. So what should we work on next? How can we test this? You could just have your output be the the return we just did and just see if it works. Does that make sense? Where it says message, you could. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, so right here, we could call triangle area. Yeah. And we could put in like five, five, and five, something like that. Yeah. Numbers. All right. Let's, let's try it. So this should get called when we push this button even though we don't care about any inputs at the, at the moment. So push the button. We got errors. You see these errors piling up when I click the button? So let's refresh this. We have one error, invalid or unexpected token on line 34. All right. So let's see, invalid or unexpected token. Ooh, I wonder if... It looks like these, I'm going to hit Control-D to select each, each instance of them, are not subtraction signs. So I'm going to put a hyphen in there. See how they changed colors? They were like, maybe they were like long dashes in English or something like that. I don't know what they were. Uh, but copied over from the chapter that um, these are different characters than these are. Okay, so let's try it again now that we... Okay, good. Errors are gone. Run the function. All right. So we could test this out if we wanted to. Um, let's not worry about it right now, but if I wanted to, I'm sure I could find a triangle area calculator on Google pretty quickly. Um, but we do have an output, so I'm happy with that. And 10 seems like a pretty logical number of a triangle that's five by five by five. So let's go ahead and keep going. All right, so I'm gonna change this back to message. Now, what should we do? What, what do you guys think we should do next? We need to calculate the volume, right? Yeah. All right. So let's work on prism volume. So function, prism volume. All right. Now it looks like triangle area is doing our heavy lifting. And all we need to do for prism volume is just this, right? Yeah. Okay. So let's return that. Add some parentheses there. And it won't like this that I'm like have an undeclared variable right there. So we have triangle area times length, but prism volume will have a number of parameters that we'll need to use. Okay, how does that look? Looks good. Okay. All right. What next? What do you guys want to do next? Our inputs. Inputs. Perfect. All right. So I'm going to put this break up here. And I'm going to hit Control-C and Control-V three times to paste that line of code that I copied. Uh, we can rename this to side A. Whoops capitalize that side B and side C. And this one will be our length. Okay. And then I'm just going to run this over here just to make sure it kind of looks how I'd expect it to look. Looks a little bare. I, what do you guys think about putting some labels here? I think it's a good idea. Okay. So I'll, I'm holding control right now and clicking to be able to make these multiple cursors. I'll say, please enter side length, and then I'll just copy these, okay, and please enter the depth of the triangular prism. All right, let's run this again, see how, how it looks. Okay, oh, that's because our page is small. All right, so that's what it looks like when our page is regular sized, all right. 
Um, if we wanted to make this prettier, we could throw this into a table with the labels in one column and the inputs in another column. We're not going to worry about that right now. All right, so we have our inputs. Let's go ahead and retrieve those inputs up here. So again, I just hit Control-C on this line. And I, I'm going to hit Control-V three times. I'm going to highlight this ID and hit Control-D three times, and then copy each one of these IDs. And then over here, I'm going to paste them and name those variable names like that. All right. So with this, we should be able to get all of these inputs from the user. And then we just have to call uh, our prism volume function, right? That should be it. So we don't need that line of code. We can just call our, well, you know what? Let's keep it. So we'll save our volume equals, and then what are we going to put right here? Your volume function? Yes, prism volume with all four of those values that we just pu pulled in, side B, side C, and length. OK, so now if I look at this, we have the three length sides and the length of the prism itself All right, being passed into these parameters, which are all corresponding. OK, these could be any names that I want them to be. OK, they're going to get new names down here anyways as these variable names. Um, and then we'll call triangle area. And then we'll output volume right there. All right, how does this look, you guys? Should we give it a shot? Let's refresh this page. All right, so if I said five, five, and five, and the, and the depth of the prism was 10, that's a really, really big number. Um, let's see what's going on here. So I'm going to put a breakpoint right here, and one here, and one here inside of each function. Okay, make sure we're getting what we want. So I'm going to run this function again. All right, side, lay, side A is five, five, and five. Notice something strange about these fives. What do you guys notice? Did it parse float them? Yeah, yeah, it probably got 555 somewhere in there because it was like appending those numbers instead of computing. So, um, so I'm going to highlight document, hit Control D three times, and then type in parse float right here. Go to the end of the line, and uh, Let's see what happens. That should drastically change our answer. All right, parse floats in here now that I refresh the page. So let's run this again. All right, I'm actually going to disable these breakpoints. I can hit this button right here to deactivate all of them. I'm going to hit F8. And that looks strangely like 10 times what we previously got with our triangle area test. Um, so we should be good to go. Any questions you guys have about this program? If you wanted to downput your your decimal places, you can just write that out to two fix to like two or three or whatever yeah. you want in your return. Yep. So let's look if at that. If you wanted to, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great idea. So if I typed in here. Um, we're talking about rounding numbers in JavaScript, so I'll just say JavaScript round. All right, uh, I could go to the JavaScript docs with math.round, or I could look at W through schools. Let's look at W through schools. So math.round, let's see what math.round does. Okay, um, rounds it to its nearest integer. All right, let's say we wanted um, a certain number of decimal points, just like you said, James. Um, so, as I was typing, I noticed it said to one decimal, uh, to nearest up to decimal. So if I said to two decimal places, okay, if I type that in, two fixed, all right. It's right here, really similar to round, but it takes a parameter. Instead of rounding a specific number, um, you can run a function that is built into the number object, if you will, in um, in JavaScript. So JavaScript recognizes when you have a number or a string or an array or something like that. Uh, one example, uh, 
you can say string dot length. Okay, if I had a string, let's say my string was, this is a string, um, I could say dot length, and it would output, you know, 20 or however many however many characters this is. Okay, it'd be 16. That would be the output of length. Okay, and that's because JavaScript knows that it's a string, and so it has like different functions and stuff that are built into it. Um, that, that you can use to kind of work with strings. Same with a date. If you have a date object, there's a bunch of functions saying like get day or get, get month or something like that. Here's a cool one with a number, two fixed, okay? So if I have a number, which we do, which is volume, I could just say dot two fixed and say to, to the second decimal place. Now notice I'm putting it right here where I'm outputting the volume instead of in here or in here. Anytime you're returning something that was mathematically computed, you want to return it in its truest form, AKA no rounding, okay? Because let's say I rounded in here inside of triangle area. That would impact what I would get for the volume of the triangle, okay? Um, if I had multiple triangle volumes that I was needing to add up, I don't want any rounding when I'm adding them. I want to round it at the very end, okay? So let's see what we get. See if W3 Schools knows what, knows what it's talking about. Beautiful. Okay, that's a lot better than our last decimal. Okay, awesome. Good input, James. Any other any other thoughts or questions? All right. Well, let's move on to our next one. Um, calculate the total volume of a house with this program. Okay. So, just thinking about this, it'll probably be pretty similar to our last one. Um, probably with a little bit more. But let's go ahead and look at it. Okay. Common mistakes. I guess these are for their programming assignments. Here we go. All right. We just did the triangular prism. All right. This shows a very basic house. Notice that the roof space of the house is a triangular prism. Sweet. And the living space of the house is a rectangular prism. Write a program that calculates the total volume of the house, including the volume of the roof of the space. Your program must allow the user to enter the width, depth, height, and sweep, as shown in figure 9.5, this guy right here. Here are some useful formulas, okay? Triangle area, we already did, okay? So maybe when we start this next assignment, let's just copy this whole thing instead of our template. And we'll name this chapter nine, exercise six, okay? Now we're going to have to change this up a little bit, but a lot of it we can leave the same. Um, let's start with our defining table where we did last time. All right, so looks like we're going to need five functions in this. All right, do input output, house volume, living volume, roof volume, triangle area. Sweet, we have one of them done and one of them partially done. All right, so what will be our input? Let's just start there. What's going to be our input for this? Sweep, height, and depth. Yep, all of these. All right, so we'll put that as our input. Um, output, that's what that is. All right, what is our output going to be? Volume of the house. Perfect. Total volume of the house. Okay. Now, let's look at our processing. Do you guys want to split it out by function? Sure. Okay. So, let's paste these in here. Make sure they're all lined up nicely. I'm going to take each one of these functions and just delete that name. All right. So, do input output. What is it going to do? Input and output. Um, Perfect. Then output. Okay. Somewhere there, it's going to call some functions. All right. What is house volume going to do? Let's look at house volume. This guy right here, right? Okay. So let's stick that in here. Oh, I guess I didn't copy it. Okay, notice these are two different functions. 
that we're going to make, okay? And so I'm just gonna add parentheses right here to both of those. Um, but then we have our living volume. Let's see if it has anything here. With the depth and height, all right? So if we have to multiply all those, then it would just look something like that, right? And then what would our roof volume have to do? Just this, right? Okay, which means we're finally gonna call our triangle area function. Multiply that by the width to get our roof volume. And then we have our living volume, which will return those, and then add those together. Okay, how does this look for our processing? Does that work for you guys? I think so. Okay, then let's move on. Let's run this, make sure we don't have any errors. Okay, no errors. Currently the inputs look like they're for, they're for a triangular prism. So let's change that first, okay? Inputs are gonna be width, depth, height, and sweep. So let's change that. So please enter width. Oops. Wait, what was it? Sorry guys, depth. Depth, height, and sweep, okay? And then each one of these, let's just put those as the IDs. Here's a cool one that I haven't taught you guys yet. Um, I can highlight this, and if I hit Control K L, it will make it all lowercase. Control K U, uppercase, Control K L, lowercase. Just a little thing. All right, so I have these inputs, and that was all four of them, right? That's all we needed. Looks like it. All right, and then I'm going to take these IDs. I'm gonna hit Control D again to highlight these and copy these four. And I'm going to replace these var names with that and these IDs with those. Okay, good so far? All right, so we have our input of our do input output function. Uh, prism volume, uh, we will not need, so I'm just gonna delete that. This will currently throw an error because that'll be undefined, so let's change that. So do input output, call some functions. That wasn't very specific. House volume, I'm guessing is what's gonna need to be called. Do you guys agree? All right, so let's call that. Look at that, let's just copy that whole thing. And I'll put that right there. We have our width, depth, height, and sweep. So these should all be defined. And then we have our volume, and we can just leave that too. All right, good so far? All right, let's keep going. So let's work on house volume. Does that sound good, you guys? All right, so house volume, we'll have living volume plus roof volume. So let's just copy that. Make a function called house volume. You know what, this is probably over here. Save us some time. Second function. Yeah, oh, they're all right here. I'm just gonna copy all of this except for triangle area because we have it. Okay. Paste these in here, make sure they're all lined up. Um, right now I'm gonna hit Control Shift L to put a cursor on each line. I'm gonna to go to the end of the line and just open up some curly brackets and give us a space for all this stuff. Okay, so house volume, if we go up to our defining table, uh, takes living volume plus roof volume. Okay, anything else we need to do here? Whoops, with house volume? You have to call a variable in that to define both those. Okay, um, should we just have one variable for them both like that? I think so. Okay, anything else? Uh, a return. A return, perfect. So let's just throw a return like that. How does that work? That's good. Okay, all right, let's move down to living volume. Let's see what we need here. So living volume takes width, depth, and height, and it will just multiply all those together to get the volume of that 
rectangular prism or cube, whatever it'll be. Okay, so let's just copy this and paste it there. How's that look? Good. That's good. Okay, uh, roof volume. Looks like we'll have triangle area times width. Okay, so let's copy that. Make a return for that as well. Uh, triangle area is missing some parameters. So let's see what we do. What would we need here? Let's look at this picture. So it looks like sweep will be two sides of our triangle, and depth will be the other side. Do you guys agree with that? Yes. Okay. So this takes three parameters. So I'm just going to say sweep, sweep, and depth. These could be in any order. Um, because the yeah, just three sides of the triangle. All right, then we have our triangle area, which we know works fine. This is already all set up. So anything else you guys see? Should we try running this thing? I have a question. Yeah. Why don't you need parameters in the house volume for living volume and roof volume? <laughs> Good catch. All right, so we have house volume. It takes all these. Good. Living volume will need three of them. Okay, that looks a lot better. And then roof volume will need three as well, but it will need sweep instead of the height. All right. And notice, so this might be a little confusing. All of these have the exact same name, width, depth, height, and sweep. Okay, which is great, but I want you guys, you guys to know that if for whatever reason, if I named these things differently, um, I would have to pass in these names into here. And then when I get them down here, I could name them anything I wanted again, but these are all independent of each other. And I could name these variables whatever I wanted to inside of these functions. So what about the triangle area function? Because it still has ABCs there. Yep, that's perfect. This is an independent function. I can reuse it as many times as I want to. Uh, where I call it, notice I'm passing in sweep, sweep, and depth. Okay, But when I get those values, I will assign them to variables a, b, and c. And then I can use a, b, and c inside this function. Okay, So this is our one example where you know we kind of change the variable names here. And that's fine, because triangle area doesn't care what the volume of the house will be. It only cares about its three sides. You know, um, so, so yeah, so just be aware of that, that each one of these has an independent scope of the others. And I could name these things whatever I wanted to um, inside of each one, okay? All right, any, any other questions or comments or things we missed? Thank you, Amy. You're welcome. Can you clarify something for me? Yeah. When you do the return with our function do input output those parameters in house volume are your um variable names right yes these guys Not right here these. okay yep yep good question and and if we want to make that more clear um you know when i when i make a variable name uh you know here i could declare it as like w and d um and h and S, for example, okay? These also, when, when I say variable name, when I'm declaring these variables, will also be independent of what these IDs are. It doesn't matter what the IDs are, I can assign them to any variable name, and these vari variable names do not have to match. What has to match is when I say get element by ID, this ID has to be located in the HTML. It has to match with this down here, okay? But I can name the variable anything I want, but then again, that is what I would have to pass in right here. Thanks. I did mine all the same too, and then I confused myself. Yeah, yeah. It's sometimes it's helpful, you know, because it's like, oh yeah, these are all the exact same things. So I'll name them the same way. But then sometimes it can be confusing when you go into another assignment. You're like, wait, why isn't this working? So good question. All right. Well, let's try running this then. Uh, let me copy the file path and paste it. All right, so width, depth, height, and sweep. So let's say width is 10 and depth is 20 and height is 15 and sweep is five. Okay, if we run this, not a number. Let's debug this, you guys, see what we did wrong. 
No errors in our console. That's nice. Well, I guess sometimes they're nice because it shows you exactly where you're wrong. <laughs> but since we don't have an error in our console, we have to actually do some thinking. So uh, let's put a breakpoint inside of each one of these. We probably won't need them all. Um, we'll probably find it in do input output. But let's run this. Make sure each one of these are a number coming through. We have 10, 20, 15, 5. All right, so, so far so good, right? All these are actual numbers, so we're good so far. Jump into house volume. Let's make sure each of our parameters look good. Just hovering over them. They're all perfect. Okay, we're going to pass. We're going to go to living volume next. Again, make sure our parameters are good. Okay, if I was curious what this was going to return, I could hover, I could highlight from width to the end of height and see it's going to get us 3,000. Okay, uh, now we're going to go, if I blow this up a little bit or open this up a little bit more, uh, roof volume is the next thing over here, calling it with width, depth, and sweep. So we'll come into roof, roof volume and uh, if I hover over width, we have 10 right here. And if I highlight triangle area, Okay, so our error is in triangle area. All right, we have a breakpoint in there, so I'm just gonna keep on going. Our parameters here are five, five, and 20, our sweep, sweep, and depth. Now, let's see what happened, what went wrong. So I'm gonna highlight A, B, and C, make sure that we have a number here. And what I'm looking for is somewhere where there's like a string or something that's not defined. Anytime we try to do math with something like that, it'll give us the not a number error. So as long as, long as I'm seeing these blue numbers, I'm happy. All right, so we have 30. If I divide that by two, let's hover over, highlight this whole thing, we get 15. Perfect. So S is good to go. So it's somewhere in here that we have our error. All right, so S minus A is 10, so that's good. S minus B is 10, that's fine. S minus C is negative five, also fine. So I'm just gonna highlight bigger chunks of this to make sure that we're still getting numbers. Highlight everything in there, we get negative 7,500. Okay, if we try to square root a negative number, that could give us an error probably. Not a number, okay? So it's right here that we're getting the error. All right, so let's look at this. We have sweep, sweep, and depth, which we're getting, because our triangle area was working before, right? It was just fine. So we had five, five, and 20. Okay, so right here, that was 30 divided by two is 15. And then 15 minus A is 10, also 10. And 15 minus 20 was negative five. All those multiplied together gave us a negative value. Any thoughts on this, you guys? Maybe the depth just can't be bigger than the semi-perimeter of the triangle. Yeah, that's a good thought. That's an interesting thought. So let's look at this picture here, make sure we did this right. All right, sweep, sweep, and depth. So that looks right. But I feel like the semi-perimeter Yeah, I guess if the depth was like super long, here's why it couldn't happen. Our numbers are faulty. Because if you think about it, if I have like a 20 foot depth, five and five don't even add up to 10, so it couldn't be the depth. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if we wanted to, and which we should do if we were like doing this for like a customer or something, we would want to put in some error checking to make sure that the sweep is actually a legitimate number. Because right now our sweep goes like a third of the way up to the roof of the house and they wouldn't even meet at the top. Okay. So that was our error. That's, I'm all like, oh, yeah, that's weird. That wouldn't work. Triangle area was working fine a second ago. So let's try this again, giving it valid numbers. I'm going to disable my breakpoints again. And our sweep, uh, let's see. 
our sweep actually has to be able to meet. So if I put this at 10, um, that actually might still not meet. So let's put our sweep at 15. Okay, that just means that each half of the roof is going to be 15 feet long, which hopefully 30 feet together will be enough to cover the depth. Let's see what happens. Okay, and it was. Okay, and that'll be the volume of our house. All right. So any questions on this or comments or things that you guys think we could have done better or didn't anything? Okay, as a side note, if we wanted to put in error checking, the place that we would want to do it would be inside of do input output. Okay, I don't know if you guys remember the, the program that you saw a second ago when I did some error, or a few minutes ago when I did some error checking. Um, it was right in the very beginning when our function was called. Uh, so right here, as soon as I know these values right here, I could say if sweep divided by two is less than depth or something like that, Obviously, we need some math here um, because it's going to have to be greater than sweep divided by two because they're up at an angle. Um, but we don't have to go into that right now. But for for just right now, we could say if sweep divided by two is less than depth, then return. And what that will do is it won't continue the function. It'll just stop. Nothing will happen. Um, and so let's run this right now. If we did that, if I had width of 10, depth of 20, let's say again, height of 15. And if our sweep was 5, 5 plus 5 is going to be, let me just make sure this was all updated. Yeah. So, sorry, that should be times 2, sweep times 2. All right. 10, 20, 15. And if my sweep is 5, so sweep times, or 2 times 5 will be 10, which is indeed less than 20. So if I ran this, nothing will happen. Okay, I don't have any errors, nothing's happening, it's because this is returning. Um, if I want to display an error to the user, then I could make a little div down here that said um, error or something like that. And then I could grab, I could just say document dot get element by ID error equals please enter a valid sweep. Okay. So if I do this now, it said 10, 20, 15, and 5, it says please enter a valid sweep. Okay, I could make this like a red text or something if I wanted to. Um, the tricky part is, let's say I enter a valid sweep and run this. Now we still have this right here. So um, the next time we run it, I could say else, and I would put this down here. Whoops. And then I would just leave this blank. Okay, because then if we have a valid sweep, we'll just make that blank so that we're good to go. So if I refresh this again, if I said 10, 20, 15, and 5, please enter a valid sweep, 15 gets replaced. So, all right, any questions about this? Anything else you want to see or try or anything? Okay, this is a dumb question, and I'm sorry. But what if you okay. want to put feet at the end of that? If, if I that, wanted what? Sorry? To put feet, square feet at the end of your output? Yeah, just like, so right here where I have my output. Again, I don't want to change any of these numeric values, okay? I'm working with a bunch of number data types that I'm doing math with, so I don't want to change any of them. So right here, <coughs> I could just say plus um, square feet or something like that. Just add a string onto this. Now, if this starts getting a little bit long with our rounding, and if we add the label, you know, I could say var message equals the volume of this house is, and then just do some string concatenation, and then just add this on there, and then display that that variable. Okay. Thank you. We got yeah. so many things going on. I forgot where it went. I know. I know. Good question. Any other questions? All right. Well, I hope that it was helpful kind of running through these programs and writing these last two with me. Um, 
I hope that you guys recognize, I do realize that we go fast. Um, and, and I do that just because we're all at different points. Some people will appreciate that we move fast. Other people will be like, man, this is ridiculous. I have to watch this video like 10 times. And that's fine. Um, that's that's why they're recorded. One of the reasons why they're recorded, because uh, you can like pause them and be like, wow, what has he ever written there? What did he just say? Um, so, but bear with me, you guys. So, all right. Any other questions about this week before we before we call it quits? I have a question, but it's not about this week. Okay, go ahead. I was wondering if you could post the final study guide early-ish. For, yeah. Yeah, I can do that, actually. Um, I will, how early would you like it? Maybe next week or week 13. How about this? I'll send it out in an email um, after this class. I still, okay. To, okay. I still have to grade the stuff from last week. I've, I've graded most of the stuff other than your journal entries from last week. Um, but I'm a little behind because of family stuff that's been going on. Uh, but I will grade everything and then I will send out an email letting you know that everything's graded in addition to um, the final practice exam. So. Thanks. I appreciate okay. it. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. All right, you guys, thank you all for coming. Thanks for your great questions. And uh, let me know if I can help you with anything this week. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Bye, you guys.